and welcome to our Sunday morning service here at Ains Daily Evangelical. We pray that you are well. And we're going to start off with uh, a reading this morning. It's from Colossians chapter 2, starting at verse 1 through to verse 14. For I want you to know how great a struggle I have on your behalf and for those who are at Laodicea, and for all those who have not personally seen my face, that their hearts may be encouraged, having been knit together in love, and attaining to all the wealth that comes from the full assurance of understanding, resulting in a true knowledge of God's mystery, that is, Christ himself, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I say this so that no one will delude you with persuasive argument. For even though I am absent in body, nevertheless I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good dis discipline and the stability of your faith in Christ. Therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, having been firmly rooted and now being built up in him and established in your faith, just as you were instructed and overflowing with gratitude. See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception, according to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. For in him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form, and in him you have been made complete, and he is the head over all, rule and authority. And in him you were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, in the removal of the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised up with him through faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. When you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all from our transgressions. Having cancelled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Yes, Lord, let us fix our eyes upon you, the author and finisher of our faith. Heavenly Father, that this time of worship will be a sweet melody to your ears, and that you bless it, and we also, Lord, just focus on you during this time, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And the first song we've got is, Who Can Cheer the Heart Like Jesus? <laughs>
And our next song is Nothing But The Blood Of Jesus. When I survey the wondrous cross.
thank you for the words of those songs, Lord. That song that I love so amazing and I love that is so divine, Lord. It demands everything of us, every area of our lives, Lord, to follow you, to pick up our cross and follow you. And so, Lord, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for his sacrifice. Lord, we pray for a blessing upon our pastor now as he brings the message. Pray us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good morning, everyone. We're going to start this morning with uh, Isaiah chapter 42, just the first nine verses. So I'll read these verses. Behold my servant whom I uphold, mine elect in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. He shall not cry, nor lift up, nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. A bruised reed shall he not break, and the smoking flax shall he not quench. He shall bring forth judgment unto truth. He shall not fail nor be discouraged, till he have set judgment in the earth, and the isles shall wait for his law. Thus saith the Lord God, he that created the heavens and stretched them out, he that spread forth the earth and that which comes out of it, he that gives breath unto the people upon it, and spirit to them that walk therein. I, the Lord, have called thee in righteousness, and will hold thine hand, and will keep thee and give thee for a covenant of the people, for a light to the Gentiles, to open the blind eyes, to bring out the prisoners from the prison, and them that sit in darkness out of the prison house. I am the Lord, that is my name and my glory. I will not give my glory to another, neither my praise to graven images. Behold, the former things are come to pass, and new things do I declare before they spring forth. I tell you of them. Well, this is just another chapter in the sequence of chapters that we've been choosing from Isaiah. And I think last time I spoke, we spoke in Isaiah 40, and outlined there the two parts of Isaiah, chapters 1 to 39 is book 1, and chapter 40 to 66 is book 2. And the focus in the later chapters is on the power and ministry of Jesus and in the end times. And in chapter 40, one of the things that comes across there is the imminence of the delivery of the Jews from captivity in Babylon. The message seems to be the deliverance is almost here. But not quite, not just yet. And then in 40, chapter 41, we get details about what's going to happen to bring that about. And then in chapter 43, we move to other things concerning the same topic. Uh, about is And it includes Israel's return to the land. It says, I'll bring people from the north, south, east and west. Just as we've seen in the few decades of recent history, we've seen that coming to pass but in chapter 42 something glorious happens it's like in the middle of, of all these event uh, momentous events that are taking place and the stresses that can happen in that for example in our day we can see uh, what's happening in the world we can see things falling apart we can see the the terrible things that might come no not all here yet just precursors of what's happening in the seals for example in the book of the revelation we can see these coming these things coming to pass and we need to keep be strong we need to keep our faith up and in uh, chapter 42 verse 1 to 9 we have a, a beautiful message it's what's called the first servant song of jesus there are four of these we'll look at some slides in a moment but the whole uh, chapter starts with behold my servant what that means is, look at Jesus, just look at him. And that's what we need today. We're in lockdown, some of us may have been ill, perhaps not many in this area, I don't know. But there are all sorts of problems, the economic problems that might follow. There will be all sorts of things that we can think of, that would make the things that we have got used to in our lifetime that may be not there in the same way, to the same extent as they were before. We might be in a new uh, way of living. What do we need to do? It's focus on him. And isn't this so important in, in every part of our lives? We're all subject to 
uh, the fallen nature in which we live. We're subject to uh, thoughts which Satan puts into our mind. We're subject to our own fallen nature. We're subject to all of these things. And there's only one answer. It's look at him. If you have a problem with a neighbour or in the family or in the church uh, and it's weighing heavy on you, what's the answer to these things? Or we have a financial problem or a sickness problem and, and it's going round and round in our head. What's the answer? Stop. Look at him. And in this particular chapter, the Lord God of glory is saying, Behold, look at Jesus. And so this chapter, as along with the other uh, servant songs of Isaiah, is focused on Jesus Christ himself and his glory and what he can do for us. So let's look at the first slide. And the first slide is uh, just simply headed Isaiah the four servant songs and these uh, describe the su service and suffering and exaltation of the Lord Jesus Christ very very powerful messages and the next slide outlines what these servant songs are in chapter 4 we've mentioned in verse 1 to 4 this is his task and this is really called the servant song but there's a tale to that in verses 5 to 9 and it's called his endowment and then the rest of the chapter shifts focus uh, primarily away from Jesus onto the, onto the joy, what's happening in the world, and onto Israel, various subjects. But we'll just concentrate uh, today on verses 1 to 9. So the second servant song is in chapter 49, verses 1 to 6, and it deals again with his task. And in chapter 50, uh, it's his commitment, which is in verse 4 to 9. And in chapter 52, verse 13, to chapter 53, verse 12, we have the task completed. And this includes that glorious chapter of chapter 53, which describes the suffering uh, and the power of the Lord Jesus Christ and all that he did on the cross and how indebted we are to him. We're so used to uh, repeating these things, perhaps annoying that it was the Lord Jesus who shed his blood for us and took away our sin and took away our guilt. And it says in Isaiah that all we like sheep have gone astray and the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. Every evil thought, every sin, every th everything we've done that's wrong in the whole world and the terrible evil that's in the world, all of that was put on Jesus. We owe absolutely everything personally to the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is the glory, the end time glory, as it were, of the servant song. And of course, Calvary is the answer to everything. Uh, right now, we're looking to the return of, of the Lord Jesus Christ. A lot of the American preachers say that if you see the Christmas lights going up, you know that Thanksgiving is near. While we see uh, end time things coming into place, and there's so many things, I'm not going to enumerate them here, but we see because of this we know that the rapture is coming soon that Jesus is going to call for his saints and bring them up and that is if we don't go individually which can happen at any time we need to be ready all the time to go and meet the Lord Jesus Christ but this uh, particular uh, section of the servant songs really deals very fully with the ministry and commitment of the Lord Jesus Christ and surely it's a model in some sense as partial model for us we cannot emulate him he is the living God he is almighty God filled with all the omniscience and all the omnipotence of God but let's have a look a closer look at this first servant song just in summary it says look at him my delight the suffering servant he's coming quietly and efficiently is not coming with a great noise like uh, many uh, people do in the world who want to uh, attract attention to themselves uh, and put themselves forward in power and authority but he's gentle and he's gracious and he's going to bring judgment and truth and he will not fail what a glorious sentence he will not fail he will bring righteousness to earth he is the conquering king the mighty glorious God who submitted himself to shed his blood on Calvary's tree is the conquering king. 
Jesus in his two advents. The first advent, the first advent as the suffering servant, the second advent as the conquering king. But let's look at Jesus in another way. We, we know something of him and the need that we have for him uh, in our lives. And, and if we're bound in troubles and problems today, we do need to turn to him. We need to be reminded of his power and of his glory. And every day we need to give thanks for Calvary. Every time we meet as a church we have communion. Because communion is a centre of our worship. It's giving glory to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords who laid everything down for our sins. But there's another way to look at Jesus. And I took this from uh, Michael, Dr. Michael Heiser, who's a theologian. You may have seen him on the internet, on YouTube. And he goes into the supernatural powers that are evident in the world. And it's interesting that in the world in which we live today, it's a bit of a supernatural world. If I look at the books that my uh, grandsons bring home from school, for example, they're filled with supernatural things. If we ever glan glance at uh, children's television, we see it's filled with lots of supernatural events. If we look at modern films and we see what they are, we feel the world is becoming supernatural. And somehow, when you... Uh, preach the gospel to people in this part of the world it's like the young people haven't a clue they've never been taught anything but the older people uh, oh, well I mean all, it's all nearly as old as me don't actually they think they know it all they don't need reminding of it and there's a middle group in the middle think we're past all that it doesn't meet the needs of society and when I think of the I don't know, one to two thousand gospel presentations we've made in, in the village in which we live over the years. Well, I think we know of two that came to the Lord and there might be others. And we do know of some that came to the Lord and, and went to another church. That's fine. But the returns are very low. Is, uh, is our way of presenting the gospel? Does it need to be modified somewhat? Not the gospel itself. The gospel is absolutely eternal and changeless but, but the last few times I presented the gospel I, I followed my, uh, my, uh, Michael Heiser's uh, teaching on how to, to start things off and then go into the gospel and the first thing is to, is to think well why is this where's the problem why is the problem in the world where's sin coming from why, why is the death why why do we have the evil why are things as they are why is there such a threat to our, uh, to our way of life. What's happening in the world? Everything's upside down. And so you start with the spiritual battle in the heavenlies, because that's what the Bible says. In Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28, amongst other passages, we read of a spiritual battle, and the powers of darkness, headed by Satan, uh, were rebelled against the Lord God and were thrown out of heaven. So you, you've got the, the spiritual battle in the heavenlies. And that has come down to earth. Now if you look at the Genesis account in Genesis 1 of the creation, now I've come to accept that this is really a, a recreation. There was something better before it, but Satan ruined it. And it says the world without form and void. And God recreated it into something that was what he says is very good. Not perfect. There's a completely separate word in Hebrew for perfect. But the creation was very good. And he put man uh, in the Garden of Eden. And having put man in the Garden of Eden, uh, Satan took his opportunity and came and temptation came. And we know the fall of man. And we know, if we know anything about scripture at all, we know what happened, that this affected physical life. I, I believe Adam did uh, believe in, in the Lord, so he got his eternal life. But then the whole of nature uh, was affected in some way. It was a, the fall was a terrible, terrible thing. We have the promise in that uh, early part of Genesis that something's going to be put right. God is going to step in and deal with it. But then after that, uh, we get the next thing, which is the fall of the Nephilim. Nephilim means the fallen ones. It's the angels 
fallen angels came down and had intercourse with human women. And as a result of all this, we had crossbreeding, the sort of things that's forbidden in the book of Leviticus, where you, you can't uh, breed one animal with another, everything's got to be bred in its kind. And then we've got the relationships with humans and animals all forbidden. But this is what was going on in the early days. And before Jesus comes, it says in the New Testament, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. So the whole world became corrupted except Noah and his family because the human genome was altered. And that's going on today. We could be here all day looking and discussing that what's happening uh, with genetics and how things have been, even the food we eat, never mind our human bodies and what's going to happen. So there's a lot of information about that around if we start to look for it. And of course, how did God deal with it? Well, he had to bring the flood. And the Nephilim perished. And we believe the spirits of the dead Nephilim are the uh, demons which can afflict people today. But then, after that, after the flood and things got back on a, more of an even keel, we then proceed uh, for another period. And we find then that we have the Tower of Babel. That man comes together and decides... He doesn't need God, he's going to build a tower, he's going to control everything, he's going to be in charge, which is the essence of sin, isn't it? I am self-sufficient, I don't need anybody else. This is the essence of uh, what happened there. So what happened there? Well, God came down and introduced a confusion of tongues. We have all the different languages. So uh, people spread it abroad around the earth. And then what did God do? Well... He uh, called Abraham out of a terrible worldly, if we can call it that, that, culture. And he called him and he blessed him and he created a new nation. And he said, look, because of, of Babel, the nations of the world are now ru are ruled by fallen angels. And we've got uh, pressures and problems and selfishness and wars and all of these things. And that has failed, but I'm going to create my people, the people of Israel, a new nation, not listed in the original uh, list of nations. These people, uh, uh, the Jewish people, are going to demonstrate before the whole world the power of Yahweh, the glory of Yahweh, and the salvation of Yahweh that's going to come. And this is what uh, happened. And of course, when we come to Calvary, we see that the whole thing was dealt with there. We have the certainty of the assurance of salvation, the certainty of the assurance of the complete destruction of the powers of darkness, which we have not come to yet. That's before us. But all of these things. And who's responsible for all this? Well, it's Jesus. What happened at the fall? Jesus came and gave a word of reassurance. What happened at the Nephilim? Uh, all power is given to Jesus in heaven and on earth. So he, he got rid of, of, of the people who were not humans. And what happened to the Tower of Babel? Well, he just uttered a word and it was completely confused. And then at Calvary, the final victory was won. And that will be demonstrated in the return. So at every stage of humanity, Jesus is victor, is victor. And then, when I've been preaching the gospel, I've gone into Calvary and what it means. Now I've been amazed at the times I've done this, that people have responded to it. And people have started asking questions. Uh, and that interest that you get, sometimes, you know, we go on the street and we, and we talk about eternal life. Well, you, we used to be trained up in evangelism explosion. We did this in Wigan, in Newcastle, and in, in Ainsdale. I've done all of that. And, and asked the questions. And, and there's, yes, there's been some fruit. Uh, they, these things have happened. I suspect a lot of it's fall into disrepute. People have no confidence in it today. They don't have that energy and drive to go forward and present the gospel, which should be welling up in every single one of us. We should want to know that we should love people and look for those opportunities, not to be over, uh, to be pushy, but to be sensitive in it, like Jesus was, gentle, quiet, but strong and determined. That's what we need to do. And I've been amazed at how well this has this has been accepted by other people. 
it seems as though the whole world basis is being transferred. In the Western culture, we didn't believe in the supernatural. But now, people are starting to, because it's in the media, it's everywhere. And that seemed to be a good introduction to talking about Calvary, and it was acceptable. Well, let's look at another slide, the final triumph of Jesus. Israel fails and all evil is overcome at Calvary. Jesus triumphs, all people can be saved and receive eternal life. The powers of darkness cannot ultimately win, Jesus defeats them. Final victory and judgment of evil, full redemption of spirit, soul and body. Hallelujah! We're going to be with him forever and ever and ever. The final victory of the Lord Jesus Christ. And of course, through the scripture, last slide, Jesus uses believers and entrusts them with divine power. Adam believed uh, and his, some of his offspring, Noah was faithful, Abram the father of faith in the evil world, Moses fully established the nation, the Nephilim, oh, Nephilim offspring were defeated by the leaders of Israel, the giants that came, the Jewish leaders, David, and then we come to Calvary, Pentecost, the apostles, and finally you and me. All divine power to live in this life is being given to you and me in accordance with his will. Isn't that amazing? Jesus said, don't be afraid. I have overcome the world. Do we realize the power of the Holy Spirit that's within us when we yield to him? And it's an amazing thing that we, he has chosen us to be the channels of his blessing. What a glory it is. We, by ourselves, can't do anything to uh, make things better. Or, um, we don't ask him to help us in that sense, but we have to prepare our channels ready for use so that the Holy Spirit can flow through us in whatever he calls us to do and how he expresses that divine glory through our witness and testimony. So, let's uh, put the slides uh, away uh, for a while and as we think of the victory over the powers of darkness I'd like to turn to uh, another passage in Isaiah chapter 14 which describes the final victory of Satan and I'll start at verse 5 it's a bit of, more of a lengthy passage to verse 17 and it says the Lord has broken the staff of the wicked and the scepter of the rulers he who smote the people in wrath with a continual stroke, he that ruled the nations in anger, is persecuted and none uh, hinders. The whole earth is at rest and quiet. They break forth into singing. Yes, the fir trees rejoice at thee, the cedars of Lebanon, saying, Since thou art laid down, no feller is come up against us. Hell from beneath is removed for thee to meet thee at thy coming. It stirs up the dead for thee, even all the chief ones of the earth. It has raised up from their thrones all the kings of the nations. All they shall speak and say unto thee, Art thou also become weak as we? Are you become like unto us? The pomp is brought down to the grave, and the noise of thy vials, the worm is spread under thee, and the worms cover thee. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cast down to the ground, which disweighting didst waken the nations. For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend unto heaven, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God, I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north, and I will ascend above the heights of the clouds, I will be like the most high. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell, to the sides of the pit. They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee, and consider thee, saying, Is this the man? that made the earth to tremble, that it shake kingdoms, that made the world as a wilderness, and destroyed the cities thereof, that opened not the house of his prisoners. Isn't that amazing? Now this passage is certainly used uh, about Satan, and about his removal from heaven, but it also speaks of the end time judgment. When Satan is confined to the abyss, everybody looks on in amazement said, are you hit just like us? Are you as weak as we are? Are you the one who's shaken the earth and, and, and moved this and moved that and done all these things? Are you as weak as we are? And you cast down. That is the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. All evil has been overcome through Calvary. 
His love trans is, transcends absolutely everything. Jesus is all-powerful. Jesus is all-powerful in our lives. He is a suffering servant, but he has given us of this authority. So the power of Jesus is amazing. And of course in 2 Thessalonians 2.8, it says God will send a delusion on those who don't believe. So we have a tremendous Saviour, everything to look forward to, everything to hope for. This time of trouble for a believer should be a time of looking up, a time of rejoicing, a time of drawing near to Jesus, a time of being encouraged every day in the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ, what he has done for us, how he's going to deal with us today and what he's going to do in the future. Glory to him. That's where we should be looking. And then, well, what about the, our followers, the disciples? Well, the disciples will follow him because the scripture says he is the chief cornerstone. And it also says in Hebrews chapter 12, it says uh, that we have to lay aside every weight and the sin that encompasses in order to keep our channels open to him. And it says, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our salvation what he has started he will complete and we'll, it'll be perfect that is the nature of the saviour that we serve the suffering servant he is the one and we come through repentance and it's interesting that repentance is the beginning of everything if we're not a believer we need to repent of our sins and change our whole way of life then we can have faith if we are a believer and we're not living in the potential that the Lord has provided for us, we need to repent. The whole message of the scripture to the, to the Israelite people and to, we find in the New Testament is repent, repent, repent. What did, preachers, what did Peter say on the day of Pentecost? He said, you killed him, but you have to repent and believe. That's what we need to do. Jesus has led the way. Jesus has paid the price. He's a wonderful saviour. is Jesus my Lord, as the old hymn says. But now we've, we've got to the situation where he is the one who can deal with us. But there's a hymn I was, had my attention drawn to. And I'll just read some of the words in the context. Apparently, uh, in, after the Welsh Revival in 1904, Someone was called to go as a missionary to India and he went to Northern India and he tended to go to a certain tribe and people said you shouldn't go there, it's very dangerous, they're very vicious people, you shouldn't go there but the spirit impelled him to go and he went and he did preach the gospel and a family was saved but of course the, this didn't go down well uh, in the tribe in which he was ministering and the chief of the tribe called a gathering of everyone together and brought them, stood them in front of him and said that they needed to go back to the old way of life and renounce Jesus. And I don't know exactly how, how this came about, but the first verse, he stood there with his wife, himself and his three children. And the words were, I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. And he sang that, and, well, I'm not saying if he sang that, that's the report that comes across, but the words were said. And the chief killed the three children. He said, now will you follow Jesus? And the next verse is, the world behind me, the cross before me, the world behind me, the cross before me, no turning back, no turning back. And they killed his wife said, will you still follow Jesus? And he said, though none go with me, still I will follow. Though none go with me, still I will follow. No turning back, no turning back. And they killed him. But the outcome of it was massive numbers of people in that tribe gave their life to Jesus when they saw what had happened in this family and this in this man a very sad story in some ways but it illustrates that when we really love him 
and I've not faced that. I don't know whether we will. But do we love him that much? That the world is so insignificant? And that he is so mighty and so powerful and so majestic and what have I got to lose? I want to go to him. A powerful song, I thought, indeed. And to come back to uh, some other things about, about Jesus. When we look at him, and th this is uh, contained in the passage we've read in Isaiah 42, when we see him, we see a quiet authority and a quiet determination, unlike the enemy who was always making a noise. And surely this is what should characterise a believer. We need to be sure what we believe. We need to understand the gospel. We need to love, love, love and love. We need to speak the truth and not to run away from it. In whatever situation that is, whether it's in our family or in the church or outside in the world, we are people of truth and righteousness, but with grace from the Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't it interesting that in the New Testament, Paul's continual prayer for the church is for grace and patience grace and patience and when we've got grace and patience and our channels were open anything that's going to happen he's going to do it because we have made ourselves available and he will can move through us if we if he doesn't move through us well he'll move through somebody else that's got a clearer channel i believe that's the message so this is the, the beauty of jesus and it reminds me of a verse in hebrews chapter 4 verse 16 it says come with confidence or boldness before the throne of God uh, in, in prayer why are we diffident in prayer sometimes when we realize the authority we've got how can we pray to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords if we're not aware of his glory aware of his love surrounding us and aware of his power we need to be in his presence because if we come into his presence in, in fear uh, and pleading for this, pleading for that, pleading for the other. Is, is that not acknowledging that he's all-powerful? Don't we come before him saying, Lord, thank you for my salvation. Thank you for the forgiveness that you that you've brought to me. Thank you for all of these things. Thank you for your glory. Thank you for your power. Look at that, is it in Isaiah 26, that verse? He will keep in perfect peace. Him whose mind is stayed on him on jesus if our mind is stayed on him and not on our problem we enter into his presence and in his presence then we can talk is it philippians chapter 4 says the same thing in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving present your request before god and the peace of god will fill your hearts and minds in christ jesus so that is a secret and that's what we need to do but we need to come with boldness and authority because God has given that to us. To deny it is in a sense to deny him and we need to repent of that. We need to come in faith and with boldness. And then we come on to these uh, verses. It says uh, about the bruised uh, reed and the uh, smoking flax. It says in verse 3, A bruised reed shall he not break, and the smoking flax shall he not quench. He shall bring forth judgment unto truth. Well, how is that related to the determination, the glory, the loveliness, if I can put it that way, the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ? Because he simply looks at you and me. He looks at humanity. And he's looking at us, as, in a sense, as reeds and looking at a flax in a lamp. Now what is a reed? Well, a reed, of course, is grown in marshy, round, marshy ground and it was mainly, I think, used for, how, for roofing, roofing. It could be used for arts and craft, but it's mainly used for roofing. If it was damaged, it wasn't any good. And it, would, it could be thrown away or burnt or whatever they did. Uh, it wasn't any good to be used. And what Jesus is doing in his magnificence and glory is looking at humanity, is looking at us, bruised and hurt. 
and fallen. I remember years ago when I went on the evangelism course, there was a lecturer there called Lid Jacobson. Not quite sure where he is, I've lost track of him. But he had a wonderful testimony uh, of the Lord moving in his life and how the Lord used him in evangelism and other things. But what was Vic's start in life? Well, he was in a broken family. He spent most of his youth in prison. Uh, it sort of given up, there was nothing. His life had been broken, he was a bruised reed. Who could use him? He went to stay with people who offered to put him up and I think caused trouble there and uh, turned their goodness back in their face and that led to more trouble. This is the kind of man he was. But the Lord came to him and the Lord rescued him. The Lord did not break him. Satan would break him. This world in which we live would break us. But Jesus will rescue us. A bruised reed he will not break. And that is the glory, the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's interesting that Israel has been called a bruised reed. You're supposed to reflect my glory, but there's nothing. Well, I'm not going, and, and God says, I'm not going to break you eternally. Yes, there'll be a time of trouble. Yes, there'll be trauma. But Israel has come back to the land. God is going to deal with his people because he loves them. And he promised them, and he's certain to do it, and he will do it. So, Israel can be described like that, but also Egypt certainly was. In, in Isaiah 36, verse 6, when uh, the Babylonians were threatening uh, Judah, as it was then, uh, they went to Egypt for help. And Egypt was completely incapable, and Nebuchadnezzar had routed uh, the Egyptian army, and the statement is, well, you know, what are you relying on? Why are you relying on Egypt? That bruised reed, useless, can't do anything, impotent. The bruised reed is impotent. Jesus will not break, not break us. We can allow other things to break us. We can allow ourselves to break us. But if we turn to him, he will restore us. He will lift us. He will never break a bruised reed. What a wonderful saviour we have. How gentle and sensitive he is. When we look at our past lives and we can see our rebellious thoughts and some of the things that we did and some of the things maybe we wanted to do. But he came and he touched us. In my case, he came to me and he lifted my head up and he said, I love you. Amazing love. How can it be that thou my God this is our saviour. Never break a broken reed. Never, never snap a broken reed. We may feel we're a broken reed in the church today. We may do. But just turn to him. He will strengthen us. He will bring us back to full glory and to full life. This is his ministry of building his church. He is the chief cornerstone. He is building his church. He is the chief disciple, Jesus Christ. And then we look at the smoking flax. Well, of course, the flax was used as a wick in a lamp. And we all know if you've got a smoking uh, flax in, in a lamp, how odious it is. It just gives smoke. It doesn't give light. Uh, scripture says that Jesus is the light of the world. And we are supposed to reflect that light. Uh, in fact, in the New Testament, it says we are the light of the world because of, of what Jesus has done. So we should reflect the glory and the light. Maybe your, your flax is smoking today. Maybe you're not really living where you should be. You don't know what to do. You're not in that position of knowing what God is saying to you. How he's going to lead it. Well, it doesn't matter if he doesn't tell you the details. We have a problem in the church. We're not meeting at the present. We have a higher building. We don't know if we'll get back. What has the Lord said? Well, all the Lord says is, just keep looking to me and I'll sort it out. He hasn't told me exactly what is going to happen and that may be the case with you but it isn't that that matters if you need to know God will tell us what we do need to know is that we are assured in him we are walking according to the prescription he has given for believers 
through the scripture we're walking in holiness we're walking in truth we're walking in repentance and we're walking in faith and we're walking in his precious love that's what we need to know every single one of us and if we're not is our flax smoking is our witness not what it should be is it odious to some people or oh, we can all make mistakes and the world in fact will often reject the witness of the believer as we'll look at in a moment but nevertheless what matters is our lamp is it giving light are we a light to other people a light that can come through in challenge or rebuke or in information or so often in example look at my life do I portray the glory of Jesus and then listen to my words do the two match together because when we're witnessing if we talk about ourselves and uh, all we're doing is draw attention to ourselves we're not pointing to Jesus if our lives don't match then are we hypocritical we're saying one thing and doing another so if we're a smoking flax today let's get before the Lord isn't it wonderful that famous verse in 1 John chapter 1 it says if we confess our sins he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness what a glorious thing it doesn't matter what you did yesterday it doesn't matter what you did the week before it doesn't matter you're in a slough of despond it doesn't matter if you don't know where to go the church isn't being led or whatever it doesn't matter just get right today and your lamp will shine again Jesus will not snuff out that smoking flax he will bring light and life and there are examples you know there, there are people who, who, who've lived in the world's eyes a uh, terrible life a smoking flax Jesus wants to bring them back to life and he wants them to believe his word but we can have smoking flaxes in the church can't we and when we look at a person uh, sometimes does that smoking flax overcome the light that can shine at other times that is the problem you know none of us are perfect we're all far from perfect aren't we even some of the greatest men in the past have had imperfections and then you saw them in some situations and you think what the kind of a guy is this I'm told that General Booth was bad tempered and an odious person. But yet, when he went on the street singing the glory of God, the Spirit moved through him and people were saved. We just have to try and get our life in order. Wesley was a, another one, a glorious preacher of the gospel, but never got on with the opposite sex and caused problems. We, we all run into issues, but we all need a light that shines in a dark place everywhere we are we need that glorious light to shine in us and in Matthew chapter 12 verse 18 to 21 we find these scriptures repeated now why did Jesus do that because he's in the middle of the criticism from the Pharisees and then he repeats these words the implication is look you critics look you Pharisees if you want to believe that God will not snuff you out God wants to bring you back to life. God will not break you. God wants you to fix God wants to fix you. So God is in the process of repairing. But in the New Testament, and we find as we move down a little lower in these verses, that we find one of the key things there is that is blindness. God is going to remove blindness. And in Acts chapter, what chapter is it? Chapter 13, verse 78, we find an example of this <laughs> with Elymas, a sorcerer, trying to keep Sergius Paulus, the proconsul, from the gospel. But Paul stepped in and the power of God came in. Elymas's power disappeared and, and the proconsul believed. In 2 Corinthians 4, Satan has pulled the blind over the eyes of the world today. And our prayer constantly has got to be Lord lift the blind and those in our family those in our circle 
our neighbors, those around us, those we love and those we know, lift that blind that they might see the glorious light of salvation. But we have to face the fact that we live in a day and time when many will not believe. And it's a very sad time. And, and sometimes when I'm praying, you know, we went through the whole Brexit thing. And, and I used to say to people then, well, yeah, Brexit's not unimportant, but it'll be overtaken by globalism. And in fact, that is exactly what's happening, isn't it? We are being overtaken by globalism. There's much evidence for that. But in Jeremiah, when Jeremiah is talking to the nation, in chapter 7, verse 16, this is what God says to, his, to Jeremiah. Therefore, pray not for this people, neither lift up cry nor prayer for them, neither make intercession to me for them, for I will not hear. And that's a salutary thought. The New Testament talks about conscience as being seared and, and so on. And it seems that there's a limit. Uh, if you turn away from the gospel, and we as a nation have so much done that, and how sad it is. But there comes a time when don't pray for these people. And how do we know when that point has been reached? If we decide in ourselves, aren't we being judgmental? Jesus said, I didn't come to condemn the world. The world's condemned already. I came to save them. So where is the line? I don't know. But the Spirit will tell us if we ask. How do we pray for the nation? Hopefully, if at least, I don't see in the scripture a major revival, but there can be revivals all over the place. There can be a revival in Ainsdale. We need to pray for that. But we need every turn we need to be spirit led because he knows the mind of the Father and what the Father wants us to pray. It's a salutary thing when God says don't pray for these people. And as we mentioned in 2 Corinthians uh, uh, two, sorry, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, we're reminded that God sends delusion on some. It's got to that point, they've gone past the point. And of course, in the book of the Revelation, it says when, uh, when, the, when the church saints have been taken out of the world and we've got the uh, offer of salvation and some do come to salvation, but at a great cost in the tribulation period of seven years, there's a mark of the beast. Anybody who takes the mark of the beast has gone too far. Then they can't be saved. That is the essence of what it says in Revelation. So these things are there. We have to look at the realism of what the situation is today. But our heart has got to be like Jesus. And we've got to love and we've got to seek and we've got to pray and we've got to yearn with a deep, deep love. That man that gave up his family in that song, very sad in one way, but yet glorious in another way. That's what we need to be, the people that we need to be. And then the uh, Isaiah goes on to reflect the glory of uh, Jesus in many ways and speaks of his holiness, his creative power and he says there's no other, there's no other one will I give my glory to. Father says it's only Jesus. That's the only way of salvation. That's another thing today isn't it? Yeah we see in the church at large it doesn't matter you know, worship with all faith, all religion and all that, it doesn't matter. But God will not give his glory to another. Jesus is the way. There's no other way into the presence of the living God other than through the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, God, for bringing us to that place. Thank you, Lord, because you've done that. And then the last point I want to make is about the future. It says, um, is it verse 9? To thee, thou whom I have chosen from the ends of the earth, and call thee from the chief men thereof, and said unto thee, Thou art my servant, I have chosen thee, and not cast thee away. Uh, that's the wrong verse there. 
but it, in the in that uh, passage it says anything you need to know about the future I will tell you I will tell you what you need to know now that is an amazing thing that God has done that and in view of that I'd like to just turn to Daniel uh, for a moment because of what has got said in Daniel uh, chapter 12 it is and just to uh, read out some verses from Daniel chapter 12 and in verse 1 to 2 it says at that time Michael the archangel shall stand up the great prince which stands for the children of thy people and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even to that same time and at that time thy people shall be delivered every one that shall be found written in the book that's the book of the lamb isn't it and many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt so you've got the, the gospel in a nutshell in there and in verse 4 it says but thou O Daniel uh, shut up the words and seal the book even to the time of the end many shall run to and fro and knowledge shall be increased so the the full information isn't revealed to Daniel at that time the full information isn't revealed to us right now we have some information and we have outlines of what God is going to do we don't have the detail but more and more will become known as we love the Lord and walk with him and pray to him and witness for him more will become known about what's going to happen and then in verses 9 to 10 he said go your way Daniel for the words are closed up and sealed till the end of the till the time of the end many shall be purified and made white and tried but the wicked shall do wickedly and none of the wicked shall understand but the wise shall understand God promises that when we need to know we'll know and we'll understand because we're getting to the time of the end what an amazing God we have he is all glorious all powerful all loving and he's met with you and he's met with me and praise him for his name and my favorite verse again looking for the glorious appearing of our God and Saviour the Lord Jesus Christ in Titus 2 13 Amen and the last song is I have decided to follow Jesus
Lord, it's a call to follow you. It's a call to put you first in our lives before everything else. And Lord, let us take it to heart. Lord, let us not miss this opportunity before your return to say, yes, we have decided to follow Jesus. And there's no turning back to this world and its ways, but to look forward to you and your coming and your and your glory where you are seated right at the right hand of your Father. So Lord, we thank you for this message today. And Lord, we look forward to meeting once together as a fellowship and we ask for protection upon us all. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen.